My name is Antti Tarvainen. Um, I'm presenting the work that I did with Harri Vaupala over the next, uh, over the last few months. Um, this builds on top of uh, Samuel Lainas and Timo Aila's work that I think Samuel was presenting here, uh, I think three months ago. Uh, so we are standing on the shoulders of the giants again. Uh, and um, it's, um, so we present a, a neat trick that you can do, do on top of their work and it improves the results. Uh, quite, I think quite, quite much. And uh, I think it's also a very useful trick for all kinds of things that you, you might do with deep learning. So it's good to know. Um, okay, so we are talking about semi-supervised learning. And uh, so why is semi-supervised learning important? So the world is full of data that we can use in machine learning applications. Um, but it uh, takes a lot of time and money to label the data so that you know you add what is this image or what is this sound or whatever what what is it in this data that's interesting or we want to predict um, and so it would be really neat if we could use the unlabeled data effectively uh, it would save us money it would like we could use our time to something more interesting than you know labeling data. Uh, because we wouldn't need to spend a lot of time on that, we would get the applications out faster, we would get, get a lot of feedback from the you know, marketplace or where, wherever, and, uh, and you know, we could build better applications. And also, um, because we humans often don't know the correct labels, like you know, what, what is actually happening in that picture. So, um, so if if we can use unlabeled data, then then those you know that low quality that we low quality labels that we create ourselves aren't don't limit the application, and and we can get superhuman results. Okay, um, so this is research. So what we the data set that we did most of our work on was the Street View, street view House Number SVHN. Uh, so this is Google. Pictures from Google Street View, and um, they, are, they are tiny images, 32 times 32 pixels. And uh, the task is to break the label. So there's a, a, like the question is, what is the digit in the middle of the picture? And there might be other digits in the picture, but we are interested in the one in the middle. And um, there's... 73,000 images in the data set. All of them have labels. I uh, was we just talking with Timo about like uh, about the quality of these labels. Timo said that that like maybe thousands of these are wrong in the training set, but we can you know we can assume that they are mostly correct. Um, and uh, uh, the, so the, in semi worst learning, we want to only use some of the labels. Uh, so Timo and Samuel got very good results with 500 labels, and so we ask like. What about 250 labels? Can we get good results with, with 250 labels? Um, one way you can look at semi-supervised learning is, is from the point of view of label propagation. So um, let's say we have uh, this simple data set. Um, all the black dots are like examples. You can think of them as input images or something. And then the blue and red dots are the labels that we know in the beginning. So how, how we can approach this problem is that we can propagate the label information from, from each example, the, the, the examples are through the data set, so that uh, we fill the gaps um, and uh, repeat until you know, we, we have labeled everything. And in this simple data set, and, and, it, and also in many real world cases, this works very well. Um, but but the problem th th this doesn't work when when we are dealing with more complicated domains where the like the distance in the input space between the data points isn't a, isn't give us much in doesn't give us much information whether whether these examples belong to the same same class or not. So so how to deal with more complicated domains? Well, deep learning is is um, is what does that. And uh, so we somehow want to use label propagation with deep learning. And um, <clears throat> there, are, there are many ways you can marry these two ideas. Uh, and what I'm describing is, is the way Timo and Samuel did that um, in their work and, and, and what, what we have been doing. And, and 
there's a, like a succession of, of different ideas uh, that has been built over the last maybe five or ten years uh, that that have led to this point. And I, I assume that there will be there will be like uh, other 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 stuff that will be built on top of top of um, this work and and um, in the future. So um, okay, uh, imagine that the, those two black dots are labeled data points, and that um, so we fit some curve in training. We fit some curve under those, and and if we don't have any other idea about like what is a good um, good function fit for that, uh, you know, any curve will do. And so so we 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 might think that this is a this is a good could fit because it, it goes through those two black data points. Um, and um, the, the vertical line there is, uh, represents an unlabeled sample, unlabeled example. So um, we don't know what, what its value is, but we can somehow use that in training uh, in, in when we're trying to fill in the gaps between the labeled data points. So, um, so like if if you just do so so we, what we want to do is we want to somehow re, somehow regularize this so we want to we want to select the functions that we fit into this from a like a limited set that that somehow works better in the real world and um so um but before we do before we do that uh so this this would be a, like a this is an example architecture of a like a Deep learning model that 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 maybe maybe has produced this function. So um, we take an input image, um, and and let's see. Can we... No, I don't get the mouse pointer there. Okay, so so there you see uh, we get an input image and a label, um, and we feed uh, the feed in the input image to. Uh, um, neural network, uh, which has some um, has some weights that that, that that means means the weights or the parameters of the model, and uh, and then we have a classification cost, and we use it, use that classification cost, um, or the optimizer uses that classification cost to, cost to tune the weights and and find a function that that, that fits this data well, and uh, this network there is like it. It's it's a classification problem, but what the the, the curve there is a, is a regression problem. I couldn't I couldn't figure a way to do a, like a use use two two dimensions that I have here to represent a classification. So so I just drew a regression where the x-axis is is input and the y-axis is the output. Um, okay, so the first thing we can do to to uh, regularize this so that so that uh, different classes somehow work or are, 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 are better represented by this by this network is that we can add noise into this network. So um, so it means that the input like for different different inputs uh, in the x direction um, we we want that the output is still the same. So if we change the input. A little bit, so move it to the left or right a little bit. It still gives the same output. So what this does is that it creates those flat surfaces uh, around the data points that that have labels, and and it means that, like, you know, if you have a, if you see a picture of a horse, if you change just a few pixels of it in randomly somehow, it's still it, it's it's still a horse, and 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 we should say it's a horse. So this this is what we what we ask the network to do in that case. And uh, so this is a well-known method. Um, the like, if you know, drop out um, from a few years ago, and that's like, I think most of the neural networks today use some form of drop out. Um, that that's, that does exactly that. Uh, the noise it adds is not is not like additive noise, but it's it's a multiplicative noise. So so we just drop out some dimensions in the middle layers, and but it's you know, like conceptual. It's the same thing. And um, and because we because dropout does it in the middle layers, it means that it doesn't uh, it um, um, it it like how you should interpret this uh, image B is that the x-axis is now some 
abstract representation of the image, not not the actual input pixels, but but like we add noise to some abstract representation of the image, and it made like that. That means that like you know a horse that's a little bended or looks to the other direction is still a horse. You know, it's it's not it's not just uh, noise to the pixels, but noise to the like the pose of the horse or something. Okay, so um, we can also do, th do this for unlabeled examples, and so things like virtual adversarial noise does this, and also the I think the gamma model that that that's from our company um, a couple of years ago uh, is, does this. So uh, so we have so we make a copy of the model that we have, the student model, uh, and and name the new model a teacher model, and we just used to exactly the same weights there. So it's it's the same model, but we evaluate it twice, and now the th thing is that we want the student model that has noise to give the same prediction as the teacher model that doesn't have noise. And so it has the same effect on around the unlabeled data points as, as dropout, um, just using dropout head on the, on the uh, labeled data points. Um, but this has two, two problems, uh, or we can make this better in two different ways. Um, the first problem is that um, it's that that as you see in this picture, C the the uh, the Y label or the target that we have selected for that unlabeled example is at the peak of that mountain, right? And on, if we move it a little bit to the left, we would get a different different prediction, and it means that. Although we draw the flat part of the fitted curve um, and it's it's flat, it might be on the wrong level, and and so so we might might you know it might give, give you give us consistently wrong predictions, and often like usually this doesn't happen, but it happens often enough so that like to make the model not work as well as as, as we want it to work. Um, and then the other problem is that. Uh, this this curve this blue curve here means the teacher prediction. Um, so the blue curve, why why does it have that shape? Like it, there might be other you know curves that the teacher might draw that might be just as good. So so why why use this one? Okay, and and these are the things that uh, Samuel and Timo solved uh, in in their work, um, and and the next two pictures are about that. So. Um, you probably cannot see if you are in the back, but there are smaller blue circles uh, along that curve. Um, um, so, so the, like instead of taking just one prediction by the teacher, we take multiple predictions and we average them out, and we take the like the prediction that is the average of those different predictions. Uh, and if we do this. Like if you use stochastic gradient descent, uh, like we always do, always do, uh, then we don't actually need to take those different predictions at the same time. Like, but we just, just like say that we take one at random, and then when when we do it, like iteratively again and again over the like, different training steps, on average it's going to be there, like in the middle. So so. So what that amounts to is that we shouldn't only add the noise to the student, but we should also add noise to the teacher model. And now it's exactly the same model. <laughs> the student and the teacher are exactly the same. So we just say that the, like the model should make predictions that are consistent with it with itself, with different instances of noise. So if we add like if we add a little bit of noise there, uh, and then we make a different prediction using a different set of noise, then it should be the same prediction. And that gives us better results as before than before. Okay, so that that's kind of solves the first problem. So that like this this um, uh, you know this this plateau uh, you know being on the top of the peak of the mountain. Now now it's 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 probably never at the peak, but but uh, somewhere somewhere that's nearer to the um, you know the average. Um, okay. But we can do even better, and and we can do so that we take um, like multiple of these teacher predictions, and and take multiple instances of the noise, like what we did before, 
and then we take average of those averages. So, so we have like many different blue curves there, and many many uh, like small circles along those blue curves, and then we draw this big circle in the middle of all of those. Right? And um, uh, now the question, like, okay, so we, what we could do is we could have like multiple teachers, and and we would average them. And I think I don't know, did you, Timo, ever try that? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because we 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 tried that, but we couldn't to get the results in temporal ensembling. But I I think it's like this. It, it in theory it should work. But then like you need to have like a lot of computation by because you would have like multiple teachers. So instead, um, uh, what temporal ensembling is is what's some of Timo's idea is that uh, we uh, average out like consecutive predictions of the same uh, example. So like in the last epoch, last time we saw this same example, same image, what was the prediction back then? And then like what is the prediction now? And we take an average of those over like multiple time, um, or multiple epochs of the training. And that's really nice and it leads to an improvement. Uh, but it has a problem and that problem is that this is very slow process. Like the more you have, the bigger the, the data set, the the more time it takes until you we get the same information fed back into the training process. Because you have to wait an entire epoch until you see the same example again. And by the time you see it, the information you had might be already outdated. Like whatever predictions you had at this moment are so much better than the predictions you had back at the previous time. Is that like you might already. Like you, you might, you might get better results by but by just using the current one. So it has a problem that if you scale the data set, it's it doesn't work as well. I, that's at least how we theorized theorized about it. We haven't actually tried that, but it seems like an obvious limitation of that. Um, um, yeah. Okay. So um, one step back. So if like if if what what, what the temporal ensembling is, does is that it it squeezes the like the expectation of where that plateau is going to be drawn into a like, smaller region. And then another question we, we can ask is that can we squeeze it even more, uh, get even better predictions? And the, like our work is an answer to these two questions. And, and here's the trick that we do. So instead of doing temporal ensembling and averaging over the previous predictions, at every training step we take an exponential moving average of the weights of the model and and then use them as the weights of the teacher model and uh, this is a well known trick uh, that that like people have used before to make better predictions but like combining this into you know Timos and Samoy's work is is what we did and and we show that it it, it works really well so um, yeah so like um, Okay, why does the, this exponential moving average thing work? Um, my understanding is that it works because, like, um, there's a lot of noise in the crate on the in the current weights of the of the model, uh, and and when you train it, like the uh, the gradients have a lot of noise in them, and so like the uh, when when you think of the fitness landscape um, of the of the weights, like they jump all over, but and, and they jump probably around the area that is the you know the best possible weight, given the information that we have at the moment. And so if we take the average of those like different points where the where the like the parameters weights weights have been, we get in the middle, which which probably gives us the best possible results. And so the point here is that we want to get the teacher give us the best possible predictions without training it any further. Because you know we are training the student, and if we train the teacher further, it's like it's just <laughs> uh, we are already already training the student all, the end, whole time and and making the teacher better that way. But if we can also improve the teacher in some other way than training, then then like we should do that. That's basically the kind of the idea behind our work. And, and this is the actual trick that we did 
to make it work, but there are other tricks. Probably there are other tricks that you can do to make this even better. Right. So, um, okay, and and that's 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 basically what we did. Um, so, what are the results? Um, oh yeah, one more thing. Uh, like now that we have the averaged out teacher, uh, we should actually take the predictions from the teacher model because it's more probably right because of the reason I just explained. Um, right. Okay, so results on SVH and uh, so here are the previous results. So uh, we compared against uh, supervised only model, which means that like that, um, okay, let's see. Oops, basically this model. Like if we only had this, what what would be what 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 is the error rate at that point? Um, and then there's uh, like the generative adversarial network uh, style thing from last summer. Um, that was you know that was already a big improvement over re previous results. And then the pi model and te means temporal unsampling. These are from Samuel and Timo. Um, from a few months ago, and then then we implemented that Pi model ourselves. Uh, yours was in Tiano. We did it in TensorFlow um, because I I have never used Tiano, so I I I I, I had to do that. Uh, and um, then w w WAC means weight average is weight weight average consistency, which is our our new new thing. Okay, so um, how did we do? Uh, okay, yeah, before that, so I, I just wanted to highlight the, like the original reason why we did why we did this. So because the temporal ensembling, of the, although it's a nice thing, you cannot do, do it with large data sets or in online setting. Online training means that like, effectively you have an infinite data set or limitless data set, and you never see the same example again. All right. Okay, uh, so our, our implementation of Pi model was worse than clearly worse than <laughs> some of them uh, I think this is because we used batch normalization instead of weight normalization. Uh, and that's just because I wanted to move along. <laughs> I, I, uh, so um, yeah, you should probably use weight normalization and I'm going to add that next. Um, so I hope in a couple of weeks we'll have results with weight normalization and they might be even better. Okay, so, so that was, and this was the baseline model that we used, and then we had the weight average consistency. Um, and, and these are the results that we got. So uh, we see a really big improvement of our baseline model and um, uh, a fair, fair improvement over temporal ensembling. But you have to remember that temporal ensembling can be used with the large data sets and, and so like we should really compare it with the pi model and, and there the difference is even larger. Um, with the using all labels we couldn't make an improvement. I think it would need different hyperparameters perhaps. Um, I th uh, we we used the, exactly the same hyperparameters or tried to use ex exactly the same hyperparameters as Samuel and Timo to make this comparison as fair as possible. Um, then we tried 250 labels, um, so you get 40% with, with supervised only. Um, our implementation of Pi model is 17% uh, or 16.59. Um, do you, Timo, do you, did you try? Did, did, did you know? Like, what did you get? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so not, not, not better than our Pi model. So, so we wanted to see if, if we can extend to this. And it, it did work, so uh, we get 5.4, um, which is almost as good as the temporal ensemble got with 500 labels. So we were really glad about that. Um, then, because it looks like we can um, we can use the unlabeled data effectively in this setting, uh, we wanted to try what if we use even more unlabeled data. And luckily on SVH, and there's also like the extra data set, which is not like traditionally used in some supervised learning at all. So like the, all these comparisons are not or, or are not using that extra data set. But um, so it has um, around half a million um, extra labels. And, and we tried with 100,000 extra and 500,000 extra. Um, uh, so, so we didn't use any of the labels, we just used the, like the samples themselves. 
Um, and um, so these results that you see there are just copied from the you know the results above. Uh, the Pi model is our Pi model, not not Samuel and Timos. Um, and um, okay, and and when we add more data, uh, more unda unavailable data, we get this, uh, these results. So our results on on like using all the unavailable data uh, were almost as good as using all labels of the primary training set. So we can really like this really scales to using large data sets, um, and and like the like we can get more improvement by using more more unavailable examples. Uh, we did also experiments on Cypher 10. So we did almost all of our work using SVHN, and then in the end we just did, uh, tried as Cypher 10 and, and like, does it work as well? Uh, the nice thing about Cypher is it, it has exactly the same data format as SVHN, so we could just take the same, exactly the same model and, and try it on Cypher 10. Um, our results there are not, not as good, so we got practically the same results as a temporal ensemble. Um, um, and maybe, maybe, maybe with weight normalization, this this would work. But I, I have no idea if you have tried with thousand or two thousand labels. But, but no, like if if you're gonna try, then like here, here are the numbers for compression. Okay, and uh, so I didn't have time to write this hard. Uh, so um, maybe I, maybe I go in in the beginning. So uh, why semi supervised learning? Because it's like it saves money. Uh, we can use our time on something more interesting than labeling data. Uh, we can get applications to market faster, and we can make up applications that were not possible before. And so what we showed is a neat trick to do semi supervised learning in uh, image recognition, but also in other settings. So this is a really simple, simple way to add some kind of like semi-supervised information to your models. We've been using it also in video prediction tasks. Um, and it, it's worked there. Uh, and we think that it works in our, in our other stuff as well. But, but we haven't tried it elsewhere. That's all. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Antti. Uh, do we have any questions for Antti at this point? Yep. Yes, I'll bring you the mic. Uh, I, I just mentioned first that um, um, hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to put this in the archive, then, then it should be there either Thursday or, or Monday. Uh, this is, uh, so that's like we have, so far we have published uh, like a short version of this on open review for the ICL, ICLR workshops, but we wrote a longer, longer version of this paper and that's what we're gonna put on archive. Uh, and uh, also the source code, um, I, I, I hope that I can start tomorrow like writing a simpler implementation of this that we can share. Right now it's very tidily coupled to our infrastructure and we cannot share that version. But hopefully within a maybe a couple of weeks there will be a version of this that you can try yourself. So my first question is that are you planning to try this on regression tasks? <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, we don't have plans for that. Um, the um, why I don't think this is as useful for the regression tasks is that um, because what what this does is create these flat surfaces around data points and uh, like well depending on the regression task this like this might be a good regularization or not but it is a, it is a good regularization for classification because you know in classification if something looks like a horse it's probably a horse but but in regression tasks, that's not necessarily the case. You don't want to create for the like the next data samples that are close to each other. You don't want to necessarily to give exactly the same answer, but but sometimes you might want to, and and this might work. But uh, like it's it's really works well for classification that I know. But but if if you try, I'd be I'd I'd like to know how how well it did work, and and uh, you know it it very well might work also for regression. And the second question, so uh, do I understand correctly that this is this is this has also like two components in the objective function? Uh, oh yeah, 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 sorry. Um, so 
um, yeah, so the cost, total cost is the combination of classification cost and consistency cost here. Do you have, did you have any like problems uh, weighting those different? Uh, yes, yes, that's a good question. Um, so I think that's maybe the, like the biggest thing that I would like to improve on this model, uh, that, that right now, um, like what we, we just did what Samuel and Timo did uh, for com comparisons and, and to make our work easy. And, and we did a ramp up of this consistency cost coefficient. And uh, so what we started at, you know, at epoch zero, it's zero because we cannot trust the teacher model at that point at all. Like the teacher model doesn't give us any sensible prediction at that point, right? Uh, but the later when, the, like when we have trained somewhat, then, then the teacher model should know like, pretty much like, a lot about, already about the, about domain and, and then we can start trusting it more. And so what we do is we ramp the, it from zero to 100 over the first 80 epochs. Uh, and, um, and that's like, I think that's might be a problem in, in like real world tasks. Here in the research setting, what we can do is it, we, we can have, like we can cheat a little bit by having a validation set that has all labels and, and that like just trying out different hyperparameters and we'll, we'll find something that works. Well, we didn't even do that. We just copied whatever worked for Timo and some way. Um, and uh, in a real world task, you don't have those extra labels because if you did, you wouldn't, you, know, <laughs> you would just use them on training and, and make the problem much easier. Uh, so you have to come up with something, maybe cross validation or something you can do to find your good hyper parameters. Luckily, um, what seems to be the case with you know our experience from the few things that we have tried this on is that like uh, the you know the whatever we first tried seems to work work okay. We don't know if they're the best possible hyper parameters, but I. You know, so so like this this is usable, but I think that's a problem, and that that really, um, I would really like someone to solve that. So how how to take into account the uncertainty of the teacher predictions in the beginning of the training and during the training, and how can we find the correct coefficient between the classification cost and the consistent cost, so that so that like this would be more robust and and uh, you know to the different hyperparameters. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, does it also mean that the amount of classes, uh, the lower the amount of classes, the better the model works? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. Uh, I, mm, one thing that's, like, we haven't, like, that's, yeah, so so we have only tried it with SVHN and Cypher like, extensively, and um, and they have low number of classes, and also those classes are fairly balanced. They are not exactly balanced. Like the there are, I think, double the amount of ones versus number of nines in in SVHN, but still like, they are fairly balanced. And is this something that like makes it easier for the network possibly? And and so. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, like whether this uh, and how does this scale to data sets with lots of number of classes. I don't see any fundamental reason why it shouldn't, but it might be a problem in practice. We just don't know yet. We do have some plans to maybe try this on ImageNet, which is the also like a research data set, but but much larger one, and and that will give us a I, I hope much better intuition about how it works in the large data sets. All right. Thank you, Antti. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.